and welcome to another edition of IDS Talks Podcast, Transatlantic Tea Time Edition. My name is Jonathan Sachs. I'm the Chief Revenue Officer at IDS, and today we're joined by Daniel Ruprecht to talk about proving a negative, particularly in the context of furlough fraud. Dan is a director here at IDS and works out of our London office. Welcome, Dan. Hey, Jonathan. Always great to see you and, and always better to speak with you. So uh, great to be here. And uh, even better that uh, next week you'll be able to see me in person for the first time in two and a half years of yeah. working together. I mean, it's it's hard to believe. I mean, we've we've been working together for so long and, and I, I see you as a brother and a friend and a, and a colleague. But the, the fact that we've never been in the same room together uh, it's a, it's a sign of the times, I think, but, uh, <laughs> it, but is, it is, it's amazing. But and it's, I think it's very fitting, particularly in light of this conversation that we're going to have about proving a negative and, and furlough fraud. Um, you know, you started at IDS in, I think, April of 2020. Yeah. April um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, let's go back. It's like a hot tub time machine here. Uh, let's go back to 2020 and, um, and that time period, right? The uh, COVID was uh, was raging. People were being told to stay at home uh, and stay away from, frankly, everybody except those in their bubbles. And uh, I, you know, governments put into place measures to help businesses stay afloat. Uh, here in the U.S., over there in the U.K., countries throughout the the world. So, uh, for those who don't necessarily know what the U.K. did. Uh, I think that's that's the best starting point for us. So take us back in time, uh, twenty twenty, yeah, spring for, for for sure. It's it's not a time that that I like to reminisce about. I mean, it's it's not the the most positive time in history, but but it is a a period where it, you know governments and and economies and and people were tested in ways that that we haven't been tested. Uh, it, in quite some time, and and I I, I will say that in in many cases, uh, you you know people and and organizations and and again governments uh, r rose to the occasion, and and I think where we find ourselves today, albeit not perfect, uh, is, is actually a testament to to how we've been able to keep people afloat and and manage uh, you know the tough times that we were presented with. Um, like everybody else, I mean, when I started out at IDS on on April one, I mean, it was quite literally four days after the the British government said no, you know, everyone has to stay home, and and we we essentially started IDS Ltd uh, from our basements. Um, but we were some of the lucky few. I mean, we work in a business and we work in an organization that it was equipped to operate remotely. Uh, our pivot wasn't a huge pivot. We had experience in in collaborating over uh, technology and and working in in a space that relied heavily upon uh, you know the collaborative tools that we have. Uh, but for most people, uh, they were told to stay home and and their jobs couldn't be performed. Uh, the vast majority of, uh, of 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 people's working experience took place outside of the home. Uh, in which case the government here in the UK uh, put together a, a furlough scheme that would help manage and support businesses that relied upon these uh, jobs that, that required individuals to be out in the community. Uh, and they paid about 80% of their wages, uh, again, to, to ensure that um, you know, these individuals were able to, to sort of pay their bills and, and survive. Uh, while at the same time not sinking the company uh, for for not creating the revenue that would support that, uh, and it was a very powerful scheme. It was a very uh, well run scheme, um, but like anything, uh, you know, when when money's being distributed, uh, there are a few bad apples. Uh, and through the the furlough scheme, uh, they're estimating upwards of about ten percent of that is uh, is and and is probably was was fraud fraudulent in nature. So is that fraudulent um, because the company, the organization um, didn't meet the criteria? Is it fraudulent because they got the money so their employees would stay home and not work and they actually did work? Which, which uh, fraudulent? Uh, uh, all of the above. I mean, there are, are situations whereby 
uh, companies would say employees were were sat at home when in fact they were being required to go out and work. And there's been a lot of whistleblowing uh, around employees being asked to work during this time. Uh, there has been mismanagement of paperwork, uh, mismanagement of documentation in terms of evidencing uh, whether or not individuals were uh, meeting the criteria to, to, to get this uh, you know, extra pay. Uh, there's been situations where employees were no longer working for the companies and they're still using it as a, a way to, to collect on the furlough funds. Um, so it came in many shapes uh, and sizes. Uh, there are also instances, and, and I, I would say the vast majority of them were, were inadvertent. Uh, you know, again, we were told the day before uh, that, that, that we weren't allowed to go into to, to work the following day. It was a very abrupt and quick process. Uh, and many organizations, and I would say most organizations, didn't have the policies and procedures in place to document this on day one. Uh, so I think that's where we find a lot of the issues uh, in a, a lot of these accusations and, and potential investigations. Uh, it's not just the active and intentional fraudulent behavior, but it's also the unintentional circumstances companies are finding themselves in where they may be accused of this and don't have the evidence to support it. Uh, so, Dan, let me ask you this. It, more often than not, in the in the context of employment, you usually have a lot of different data sources that can demonstrate somebody actually worked. Badge swipes, GPS data, Wi-Fi logs, computer logged activity, timesheets, all, all sorts of things to prove I've worked. and, and We've seen it here at IDS in the context of wage and hour type matters. I worked these hours. You didn't pay me for overtime, things like that. In the furlough fraud uh, type of matters, you're essentially trying to prove that no work was done during that period. And so uh, I think it might help for our listeners to understand – the situation and the types of data and how the data is analyzed when you're able to prove that you worked before we start talking about how you would prove a negative, which is I didn't work. Absolutely. And, and I think as a, as an organization, you know, IDS sits uh, very comfortably in this split in this space in terms of understanding and making sense of, of structured data uh, we often call it difficult data and 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 sort of information and and uh, sort of sources of uh, electronically stored information uh, that can generally pick and 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 develop a, a better understanding of of human behavior. Um, I often see it as the breadcrumbs to a larger conversation that that does end up providing the evidence which you're looking for to to build the arguments that you're making. Um, when we start bringing all of these different data points together, we, we can start developing what we would call a day in the life or, or, or a baseline uh, in terms of what a person's activities are and, and what we would expect that person to be involved with on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, now, this differs from, from company to company, and it requires uh, a very consultative approach where you know individuals... Uh, sat within our organization that specialize in identifying these types of data sources, uh, start to analyze those interactions that the average person within the organization interacts with on a daily basis. Um, so a lot, uh, yeah, oftentimes I, I think of it, you know uh, an airport, for example, if you work at, at Heathrow Airport, uh, you, you may swipe your badge when you when you come into the office or when you come into the building, it's, it's highly secured. Uh, parking lots are are well organized and have to go through with a, again badge stamps just to park your car. Video cameras all over the place. Uh, there are any number of different technological devices that, whether you realize it or not, you are interacting with it in some way, shape, or form. If we start to identify those devices and those technologies that are recording these activities, slowly you can start building building out. Again, what, what, what a day looks like for, for that particular individual or many individuals. 
uh, you, you know, as you start collecting the data. Uh, and, and the good thing about this sort of analysis is that contrary to a more standard approach to digital interrogation, in these situations, the more data points you have, the more information you're able to gather and the more accurate you're able to, to sort of identify those behavioral activities. Now, again, I mean, we live in Europe, so you know we're always considerate about data privacy, data protection. But if we're interacting with, let's say, 80 different eight, uh, data sources on a daily basis, you probably only need three to five uh, to really gauge or develop that baseline approach. Uh, and once you're able to do that with the right data sources that are within the regulatory rights of, of the individual, uh, you then create an opportunity to say, okay, this person worked exactly when they said they worked or worked outside of when they were supposed to work and were due extra. Or in our case, if we're talking about furlough fraud, did not work. So if we know what their workday looks like, we can flip it and basically say, okay, if this person was told to stay home, now we need to see a baseline of zero. All of these activities that we know they have interaction with have to drop to zero, if that makes sense. So you're still collecting some of the same data sources. You're just looking to see no activity, flatline. Yeah, you're essentially creating context to disparate data sources and providing the, I, I would say the Rosetta Stone to bring it all together. And that all starts to make sense. So once you understand what it is that you're after and you've identified the goal or the question that you're looking to, 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 to get to the bottom of, you create that baseline, you understand what a day in the life looks like, and then you compare it to what you're after. If that person's not supposed to be working on that, that day, these door, data sources are supposed to tell us this. Uh, and again, it's an opportunity to have a bit of evidentiary understanding around what an individual was up to when that individual was supposed to be working at home or not working at all for that matter. Uh, do you think that the government may ask for the same data sources during a period of time when that person was working to then come to, so they can do the comparison of this is what activity on a Monday through Friday pre furlough looked like and this is what it looks like post furlough so you're actually collecting for two periods of time um i mean potentially they would be doing that i i don't know if they go as in depth i mean in in my experience most most regulatory investigations are are built and born out of whistleblower information uh so they oftentimes go into a subject with some base knowledge of of what might have occurred uh, once the, the organization is on the hook for sort of trying to build understanding around what the whistleblower was saying, the shift, is bur uh, the shift of burden sort of switches to the other side and, and evidence needs to be collated on behalf of the, the companies to showcase that, that what they've requested in terms of furlough funds was uh, uh, above board and, and, uh, and essentially in line with the requirements that, that were due uh, to, to collect on those funds. Um, so again, I think uh, part of the conundrum in, in these scenarios is that, again, going back to, to what I mentioned earlier, uh, when you're told to stay home, quite literally, you know, the day after the announcement was made, uh, collecting and creating the paper trail uh, to evidence everything was done correctly in an, in an environment when no one really knew what was going on uh, and no one really knew what to, to sort of collect and, and put together these alternate and alternative da data sources uh, are a good avenue to, to help create uh, an understanding when understanding is hard to get to, if that makes sense. It, it does. Well, listen, I, I look forward to what I think will most certainly be a follow-on podcast where more of these types of actions are commenced um, and the outcomes are... Uh, shared and, and and what learnings we can can get from them um new element to the uh, ids talks podcast my closing question no, what no. is your current binge or what have you just finished binge watching 
So this is actually funny. I mean, we went through over the weekend White Lotus. Uh, someone recommended it uh, to, to my wife and I. And, and I think we went through, you know, two seasons in, in roughly a week. Uh, it was a, it was a, it was a pretty good show. It, it had its moments. It was something that was quite original. So, so I thought it was a, a good little watch. So I just finished all five seasons of the last kingdom. Oh. I, you know, I, I figured I should be prepared if I go over to London and Vikings suddenly show up and are trying to, you know, take over some land. Yep. I should at least be prepared. Right. Yeah, well, you're you're going to be meeting me out in Guilford, which which is more from the time of uh, William the Conqueror. So it's 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 relatively a a, a new build when compared to Utrecht of uh, the Last Kingdom. Yeah, uh, but hey, if you want to go old school, we can hop over to Winchester. Uh, it's not too far away. Ooh, we may have to do that. Yeah. Well, I w- <laughs> I want to thank Dan Ruprecht for joining us today, as well as our regular subscribers and those of you that may be first-time listeners. If you'd like to learn more about IDS or subscribe to our IDS Talks podcast, you can visit idsinc.com or wherever you normally get your podcasts from. Thank you again for joining us, and I look forward to talking more about data with you on our next edition of IDS Talks. 